Hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I'm great. Let's talk about the purple passion plant. Purple passion plant, purple velvet plant. The plant I've wanted to talk about on this channel for a pretty long time. If you've never watched one of my spotlights before, I like to do a brief rundown for the people who don't want a long lengthy video talking about the plants and then I go into more detail. Purple passion plant. That's the Jainura Arantaeca. I prefer bright indirect light. Morning sun is okay, but they're going to need afternoon shade. Keep them out of direct sun, especially in warmer climates. They have moderate watering needs. They don't like their soil to drought for a very long time. And they're non-toxic. It's a safe plant to have around the house. All right, so that was the brief rundown. A little bit more on this plant though. The purple passion plant, I have trouble saying that for some reason. Purple passion plant, purple velvet plant, whatever you wanna call it. These plants are an excellent house plant. They have gorgeous, beautiful purple hairs that cover their foliage. It runs all the way down along the stems. As the foliage does mature, and age and become larger it will sort of spread open a little bit more and that will reveal more of a green metallic -y undertone in the foliage which you can kind of see at the right angle this is one of those plants it's almost like a multi-chrome effect as it shifts around then you can see different colors within the foliage mostly just purple and green yeah you know, there's almost like a multi-chrome effect to the foliage as the different angles change and shift you can sort of see those green yeah see the green under there you can see that in there so even though they tend to look purple at first glance it's actually green foliage it's got that chlorophyll in there and then it's just covered with those pretty little purple hairs there is a variegated variety that i've seen before for these plants i well i've seen it online i've never seen it in person before but it looks cool i don't know how much it would detract from just the general nature of what makes this plant special being purple and green the way it is but for the variegated lovers out there you have an option if you wanted to go that direction one of the reasons these are such a popular houseplant is because they tend to prefer the conditions that are more typical within the home they're native to southeast asia they're kind of scattered around the place but generally they grow in areas that don't get incredibly hot they are in more of a mild climate so anywhere from 60 to about 75 degrees indoors and they're pretty happy i have this one out here in my grow space where temperatures range anywhere from 60 up to like 86 88 at the absolute highest i try to not let temperatures get above about i don't know 82 to 84 in here but sometimes it happens it just it depends on if it, the weather reports wrong and it gets really warm outside and then the thermostat doesn't kick it that doesn't matter it's not like it's just going to drop dead if temperatures get really warm at least for a brief period if you live someplace like southern florida i mean really maybe anywhere in florida where it's uh, the summers are incredibly hot or just the southwest southeast of the u.s in general well, heck, even where I live, the summers are too hot to keep this outside. It's not going to do well when temperatures are in the 90s and there's just heat radiating from all directions. That's not really their preference. I'm sure that there are some situations, uh, perhaps if you live more in a coastal area, then sometimes that can create exceptions to that. There's coastal effects and whatnot, but typically 60 to 75 degrees is kind of their happy place. And of course, as with any plant, if temperatures are on that lower end of the range, you want to be more careful with watering. If you water too too much when things are cool and the plant isn't taking up any nutrient it's just kind of chilling and waiting for the cold to pass that could create problems and because of them being a plant that prefers a consistently moist soil i like to go ahead and make sure that these get watered whenever i notice that the surface of the soil has dried out typically i just give the pot a little bit of a lift i can usually tell when the plant needs water in general if the soil color is light and feels dry to the touch then that means it's time to water the plant i make sure that the water goes all the way out the bottom of that pot and then i repeat that at least one time usually twice so water drain water drain water drain making sure to have that process done at least twice i try to do it three times just helps ensure that there's no air bubbles or anything in there no areas in that root zone that are still dry I want things to be consistently moist for even root growth and then of course even growth of the plant overall they really do prefer a soil that is somewhat moisture retentive in my experience these can dry out a smidge not for too long but just like for a brief spell and if you give them a good watering they should bounce back although that's not ideal right i'm just saying that it has a little bit of forgiveness in it it's not like it's just going to drop dead like some plants do if they get a little bit too dry uh, this one has actually gotten very 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 dry before which uh, was somewhat intentional because i wanted to see if i could get the leaves to crisp up to show for the video and it didn't 
really work very well. But I was able to kind of get an example of what old drying foliage looks like. So there's this right here. See how it's, you know, starting to yellow, but it's still firm. So that's not rotting. This is just because the plant got way too dry and then that's its old foliage. You can see there's some browning here along this foliage. That's a result of the plant being too dry or the humidity being too low or any combination of the two. It's just that brown crispiness. That's from missing a water and things got a little bit too dry out here. You can see the plant's okay. It bounced back just fine. Uh, the foliage is okay. I could remove that if I wanted to. It doesn't bother me. It has chlorophyll in it, so it's benefiting the plant. So I don't see a reason to remove it right now. If there were a lot of it, I probably would, but I think it's okay. The foliage is kind of cupped and firm, which some of this sort of is. You can kind of see right here how that's cupped and a little bit firm. Cupped meaning it's slightly folded. Then that can be a sign that the plant maybe would like a little bit more water. Give this a really heavy drink before I started filming. So those should pop back up pretty soon here. Higher light conditions can also create that more of a stiff foliage and smaller foliage. The more light they get, the more intense the purple color is going to be. Chances are the foliage will stay a little bit more on the small side. They don't need great big gigantic leaps to absorb light when they're getting more and more. Purple passion plants also have a very unique, I mean, it's not really that unique, but they have an interesting growth habit. They start off upright and they grow up and up and up and up, and then they fall over <laughs> into more of a cascading crawling kind of growth habit. That can happen anywhere from one to four feet. Typically they'll stay upright till they're at least about a foot and a half and then they'll start to go over. Go over. I mean, that's when they'll start to sort of trail and crawl a little. They aren't terribly picky about their soil medium, but it shouldn't be anything that's really void of nutrient. Like I wouldn't put it in a cactus mix, but something that's just like a basic potty mix is totally fine for them. And that if you can work in some extra organics, they definitely would appreciate that. Being a plant that likes a consistent amount of moisture. They're also humidity lovers. I have had these in areas where they didn't get a ton of humidity and they did okay, but I had to water them more. That was the main thing is that if the air is kind of dry, then they need more water. That's typical of any plant that likes a lot of humidity though. This is not a plant where I would ever recommend misting the foliage to keep the humidity up. I mean, that's really only effective for like a small amount of plants because that water evaporates fairly quickly. Keeping moisture around the plant is the best way to keep humidity up. Keeping them with other plants that have a good level of transpiration like spathophyllums, peace lilies, things like that, that'll help create more of a moist environment around them. Having a tray underneath them with pebbles to lift them up and above some water that's in there that helps a lot too but it, you don't want water settling on that foliage all those little hairs can trap that moisture in and it, it'll take too long to evaporate and then you can have issues with fungus and bacteria it just makes the plant susceptible to not being healthy it's more of an indoor thing where there's not a lot of airflow around to help get the moisture evaporated off of that foliage in a timely manner outdoors probably not going to be as big of a deal right well passion plants are just fine with a standard all-purpose fertilizer it doesn't have to be anything super fancy i just just use the regular strength during the growing season. I usually water bi-weekly, so every other week, twice a month, that does the trick just fine. During the winter months when I'm indoors in my grow space here, I do always put just a quarter strength all-purpose fertilizer in my water with everything I'm watering, but it's very warm out here and there's a lot of lighting. It's not really uh, comparable to typical indoor growing conditions. If you notice the plants just sitting still in your house, then I wouldn't fertilize it. I wouldn't fertilize them if it doesn't look like the plant wants to grow. Uh, that's, I'm talking outside of the active growing season. Essentially in winter time and probably late fall, probably maybe a good idea to be more careful with fertilizing, but during spring and summer, go for it. At least once a month, they'll appreciate it. I've used seaweed fertilizers on them and they seem to appreciate it. They haven't been really picky as far as fertilizers go, which is surprising because this is actually a plant that has fairly delicate roots. And sometimes plants with delicate roots can have some burn and some scorch if they get over fertilized. But well, I try not to over fertilize. So that's probably why I haven't noticed anything too bad with that. But it's something to watch out for. Be careful. Don't, you know, use too much just to be safe. Just stick with whatever the label says to do. As I was mentioning, delicate roots. That's one of the reasons I hadn't potted this up quite yet because I was a little bit on the fence about having it in a pot that has some curvature here on these sides because of those delicate roots. I uh, don't want to pot this in here and then when I go to repot it, try and get the plant out and have that resistance on these edges that will potentially tear up the roots and damage them. And uh, the foliage, the stems on these plants are I wouldn't say delicate, but they do snap very easily. So if I struggle to get the plant out and I have to pull an awful lot, 
then I could end up just tearing the whole thing apart. So for right now, it's just sitting in this lime green pot. I don't know what color it's gonna look like when I'm done editing, like once it's up on your screen, but it looks very pretty and lime green to me. My viewfinder, it looks yellow. I'm not thrilled about that. I hope you can see how pretty my green pot is. But yes, those delicate roots, so they're susceptible to root rot right? So do not let these sit in water. They need something that drains well. Make sure there's a hole in the bottom of your pot. Take them to a sink to water them if you need to. Ultimately, just make sure that whatever's going on down here, that the uh, soil, the root ball, isn't in contact with sitting water because rot. I just rot. You don't want the plant to rot. A lot easier to bring a plant back from being underwatered than from overwatered. As far as pests are concerned, they have some susceptibility to mealybugs, scale, and spider mites, and I have been battling mealybugs out here for a long time. Is that one right there? No? Okay, that's not a mealybug. Okay, we're good. I haven't actually noticed any mealybugs on mine yet, but I, I'm i keeping my eyes on it because I'm just waiting. Pretty typical pest, nothing that unusual. But if the mealybugs and scale and spider mites like them so much, I don't really, I don't know why the white fly wouldn't enjoy them. Also, unless maybe the hairs are annoying, but I would think that would be annoying to the scale and the other, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Moving on. Going to talking about some of the like fun little things, the eccentricities with the plant. This plant has very stinky flowers. They they smell pretty terrible. So uh, it's a good idea. Usually these are flower buds right here on this. They flower fairly freely and it doesn't hurt to go in and cut those off. Just keep them off the plant. It'll encourage things to stay more bushy and more full and you won't have to deal with that funk. On that note of cutting the plants, these are extremely easy to propagate. They root very, very readily. You can just go in, make a cut, just like so you don't want too much foliage on the plant. If there's too much foliage there, it can't support that. And then you can dip this in a rooting hormone. You don't have to. And you can just stick these right back into that soil as long as it's staying consistently moist. Or you can propagate them in water, let them root out, and then transplant them. It doesn't really matter. And of course, with propagating, it's always a good idea to make sure that the plant is fully hydrated when doing so. And you don't want to hold the cutting outside of the soil or water for very long at all. Sometimes it's a good idea even to go ahead and take the cutting, put it into a bowl of water, and make your cut underwater so you don't get any air bubbles in there. They're pretty sturdy plants, so I've never lost any cuttings on these before. But it doesn't hurt to make sure that they're hydrated and there aren't any air pockets or anything like that inside those stems because that'll interfere with water being able to get from the soil or water whatever you're propagating them in into the foliage and then it just you know the plant will die that's not good you don't want that to happen they take root very easily a lot like a coleus actually as these grow up and then start to fall over and cascade across the soil any area where you have a node meeting a leaf wherever that's in contact with some most soil most soil with some moist soil that will root out and start to grow new plants then you can make cuts along that area and then new plants will come up in between each one, which makes this actually a pretty aggressive plant. It could fill in an area very quickly. If you live some place where you can grow this outside, that is something to be kind of cautious with. You don't want them taking over your entire garden. These are noted for being a, a plant that has somewhat of a shorter lifespan. Now, the more you stay on top of keeping the flowers pruned off, that may extend things a little bit, but I think anywhere from like four to six years, somewhere in there, and uh, the plants usually start to die. Though I do know someone who said they've had theirs for like eight or nine years. If any of you have had yours for more than four or five years, comment down below, let us know, because the information on that is scattered. You'll know your plant is getting old when the foliage starts to become very dull. It starts to lose its luster. There's not going to be as much of that metallic-y green shifting color as you move the plant around. But don't forget that it is totally normal with these plants as they mature for the foliage to become larger and more open and therefore you'll see more green than purple as the plant gets older. That's totally normal. You're not doing anything wrong there. Always move them to more light. Just like I said, make sure it's not direct. You don't want to burn them, but the color does intensify with more light. It's a good idea with these every couple years to go ahead, take cuttings like I just did and keep them propagated because that'll keep the plant going for longer. And then as the old portions start to die out from old age, you'll always have fresh new baby plants underneath it. It'll just keep on growing. If you live someplace where you can keep this outside certain times of the year, these are beautiful plants to put into hanging baskets. A lot of contrast, whatever else you have planting with them because of that cascading crawling habit as they get bigger, they'll come out and pop out from whatever else is in the basket. It just looks pretty neat. It's an excellent plant for adding color, texture, and contrast. What are some of your experiences with the purple passion plant? Comment down below. I love talking to everybody. Tips, tricks, suggestions, anything. 
always appreciated. That's how we all learn and grow together, right? I have all of my social media linked down below in the description of the video. Instagram's usually the best place to get a hold of me. If you haven't already and you'd like to, you could like the video. It makes a big difference for the video and for the channel, and I appreciate it. And subscribe as well, and hit that notification bell. That way you know when new videos come out. I hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life, and everything's just going beautifully for you. No? Nothing? Too close? Focal range? That's still a thing? There we go. Okay, and of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.